Hello? Well, good evening, everybody. I uh, apologize for that. I had myself on mute. This is Bob Mater, uh, Chairman of NAFI. Glad to have everybody here with you in what is uh, a chilly night in St. Louis. Yes, tonight I'm in St. Louis uh, through the miracle of technology. Uh, appreciate everybody, uh, as I said, being here. Tonight we were going to have a uh, guest from the NTSB, and the NTSB being what it is, called our uh, guest away uh, on assignment. Uh, at the last moment, but we're very fortunate to have Nick Frisch here with us tonight, uh, who will uh, talk to us about, uh, I'm going to call it a value-added pro uh, proposition in using simulators for our flight students. And uh, Nick is Director of Sales and Marketing for Glassair. And Nick, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, and uh, feel free to toss in a plug for Glassair. Okay. Well, thanks, Bob. I really appreciate that. Um, I've been an instructor most of my life, uh, and, and through no real merit of my own but great good fortune, when I was in my 20s, I became a Kinger instructor at the Beach Factory. Uh, and the beach training was eventually bought out by flight safety, and so I became a flight safety instructor, and I gravitated over toward the piston airplanes. So I ended up teaching the Beechcraft product line. Uh, and the way that the training worked at the Beach Factory is a lot of the training was done in simulators and then gravitated toward the airplanes. And that's where I got my first taste and understanding and appreciation for the power of simulation and training. Uh, and I've kind of carried that through with the other instructing things that I've done. Uh, and I'm actually really passionate about it. And I think it has the, the possibility to change our industry for the better, and that's what I hope to talk about tonight. And a little plug for Glass Air. Uh, I didn't know anything about the Glass Air Sportsman when I went to work for this company, but it is a delightful airplane. The DNA is float plane. Uh, it makes a great float plane, backcountry adventure airplane on big tundra tires. Uh, a bush plane, but it's also a very civilized traveling machine, and it'll go about 140 knots at, oh, very a, nice. at a typical cruise. So uh, Glass Air Sportsman, that's my plug for Glass Air. Look us up on the Glass Air website. Uh, and now I, you know, I, I think we probably ought to talk about training issues. That's, uh, that's great. Well, you say that uh, you came out of uh, Beach Slant uh, Flight Safety. Uh, well, why don't we start this off with what, what is, I mean, we all talk about the big advantage in using simulators. The old joke is, I can tell you, I've killed a th pilots thousands of times without harming them in a simulator. And that's kind of, that's kind of silly. I mean, we've stolen that from NASA over the years uh, during the, uh, the, the Apollo and Gemini missions. But what, what is the real value other than uh, the jokes about it? <laughs> um, well, the real value is, is effectiveness. So this is an illustration that I often use you know, further along in my presentation, but I'll use it now since you asked the question. Um, okay. Let's suppose that, that somebody gave you a, a piece of sheet metal, a, a piece of aluminum, and, and your job is to cut through the piece of aluminum, and then they give you a, an X-Acto knife. 
Now that exacto mm -hmm. knife is not going to cut through that piece of aluminum in one pass. So you're going to make a cut, and then you need to make another cut, and you need to make another cut. Uh, and if you make each cut exactly the same, then a couple of things are going to happen. One is that you're going to get through the material much faster than if your cuts are are not on top of each other. So you can imagine the blade kind of skittering across the surface and jumping out of the cut and making scratches all over the metal uh, because the cuts aren't in the same groove. Uh, and you know, the, obviously, if the cuts aren't in the same groove, let's suppose you made 10 cuts, one on top of each other perfectly, then you uh -huh. know where the 11th cut is going to go, right? You've got a nice deep groove. Uh, you can predict what's going to happen. But if you've got 10 cuts and they're all different, then where's your 11th cut going to go? You really don't have any idea. That's and in training oftentimes, what we end up doing is we end up making a lot of cuts that are not on top of each other. And the reason we do that is because we can't really control the process. And we can't control the process because we're in an airplane and we've got stuff to do because the airplane's moving and it's an airspace and there's traffic and so forth. Uh, so oftentimes what we end up doing is we make a lot of scratches, but they're not consistent, they're not on top of each other, and the net result is we can't necessarily predict the 11th cut and further we haven't gotten through the material. So um, in a nutshell, I guess I would say that's how I think of simulation and training in terms of effectiveness. Oh, that's a uh, that's a great that's a powerful analogy. I like that. So I, since I jumped you all the way to the middle of your presentation, I apologize. Why don't we come back a little bit? Um, and you were very impressed initially uh, when you first started seeing uh, simulation in the King Air universe. Uh, why don't you tell me about how that how they started forming your opinions and how that leveraged off into your other instructing. Well, I, I learned stuff using simulation. I've, I learned a, a lot about teaching, and I learned about some other things as well, uh, things that I thought I knew that I didn't. I'll give you a real quick example. Uh, so when we got our Baron simulator at Flight Safety, my job was to make sure that the sim flew exactly like the Baron. And, you know, I went through these procedures, but, but I had this new toy, and it was kind of fun. Uh, and I had been teaching people in twin training, you know, if you have an engine failure after liftoff, what you do is you just pull the power back and land straight ahead. And, of course, I'd never done that in an airplane. But I thought, wow, I can do this in the sim. So I did a takeoff, and I pulled the power back and attempted to land straight ahead, and I crashed. And I thought, wow, okay. Uh, I must be a lousy pilot. So I tried it again, you know, three or four times, and each time when I did it, I crashed. And I thought, well, this is not a very good simulator. Um, I wonder what the airplane would do, but I didn't want to do it in the airplane, right, because I was afraid I might crash. And then I finally right. came to the realization that if you have a twin-engine airplane that is in a nose-high attitude at low speed, and you convert one engine from thrust to drag, and your next response is to convert the other engine from thrust to drag in a nose-high attitude, the airplane is going to crash. <laughs> and so what I had been telling <laughs> people point. actually was wrong. Uh, you know, what you really need to do is you need to shove the nose down, level the wings, and then pull the power back, and you'll be able to land. Okay. And it, it, it's, it, or it's things like that. So I ended up, you know, teaching two or 300 Baron pilots, you know, don't pull the power back until you push the nose down. Push the nose down, level the wings, pull the power back, land under control. So those kinds of things were a bit of a revelation. But that, that's not... That's not the pr probably the most significant thing from a simulation standpoint. Can I tell a story? Of course. Please okay, do. Okay, I'll tell, t I'll tell two stories. Uh, the first story happened at Oshkosh this past year, and I've been involved in a couple different university flight programs. Uh, and I happened to stop by a booth of one of the university flight programs, and there was a young lady there, and I recognized her because she used to fly. Uh, and I said, hey, you know, how's it going? How's flight training? And she looked and she said, you know, I just, I had to stop. It was too expensive. Um, that's, that's one story. Mm -hmm. The other story, I was running a flight school in Seattle. I did this for about 10 years. 
uh, and we, we kind of cater to the, uh, you know, the Microsoft, Amazon, Starbucks people. But anyway, I had this guy come in, and he came to my office. I'd never seen him before. And he pointed his finger at me. He was poking his finger at me, and he said, you people. And I thought, what are you talking to? He said, you people, you don't ever really certificate pilots, do you? All you do is sell people kits and rack up the hours until they get discouraged and go away. And I thought, wow, wow, this guy's had a really interesting flight school experience. You know, we have examiners here pretty much, you know, every day giving check rides. Uh, but apparently that wasn't so wherever he came from. But he was really frustrated. And, you know, the AOPA did this survey about flight instruction because they were trying to kind of figure out why people dropped out because about 80% of the people who start flight instruction never finish. They drop out. And they kind of came down to things like the cost and the process and the instructor. But the bottom line, really, for people who drop out is that there's a, a level of disappointment. And that level of disappointment, you know, follows what was the initial excitement and eagerness to learn to fly. Uh, and then it turns into either, you know, sort of an internal, well, you know, maybe I'm just not good enough to do this. Maybe I'm not cut out for it. Uh, and the other one is, you know, the guy poking his finger at me saying, hey, you guys, you know, this is a racket. You're just racking up flight hours. Uh, and either way, with, you know, whether the customer is pointing the finger at themselves or they're pointing at the flight school, the result really is the same, which is to say that they're, uh, they're really unhappy uh, and they're leaving our industry with a really bad taste in their mouth and they're probably never going to come back. You know, so when I was running university programs, I thought about the parents because, you know, these parents were taking out PLUS loans, and the students had come, and, you know, we tell them, yeah, you know, it's $15,000, and you get the private license, and this is how long it takes. And, and uh, you know, they take out this loan, and, and you know, after a few months, the, their child is calling and saying, uh, Mom, Dad, I need some more money. I'm not finished. And if you can put yourself in the position of a parent, you know, they're, they're thinking, well, wait a minute, you know, we, t we thought it was going to cost this much. Now we have to get some more money. Uh, you're not done. Uh, and these calls oftentimes, you know, there would be, you know, two, three, four phone calls uh, uh, asking for two or three thousand more dollars. And if you're a parent in a situation like that, you'd kind of look and say, well, you know, if this, would ha if this is what happens in the private pilot training, What's going to happen in instrument and commercial? And I don't really know, but I can't afford to find out. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, the bottom line with this really is that when somebody drops out of pilot training, our industry loses that entire customer life cycle. So flight schools are losing all the revenue they would have gotten on that instrument rating, the commercial license, multi-engine, CFI, those kinds of things. Instructors lose hours. Manufacturers lose sales. And our industry needs, loses needed pilots. So I'm of the opinion, A, that this is a tragedy. And I'm also of the opinion that it can be addressed. It can be fixed. But well, we have to be addressed. What's that? We at NAPI couldn't agree with you more. Um, the uh, uh, we took that AOPA. We hated seeing the, that AOPA study come out because mm -hmm. it, uh, it was no fun reading it. But we also took it to heart. Uh, the uh, what we've really been talking about over the past couple of years since that came out is something we call excellence in flight instruction. Mm -hmm. And we we really believe that there's a value added. I in my other life I'm in a service business, and uh, yeah, I work for a major railroad. There's no and I can't sell anybody a bucket of train. It doesn't work mm -hmm. that way. The only thing I have to sell is a promise, and that's what the the, the flight instruction business is about, or any training industry. But in, in this particular case, flight flight instruction and and it's about keeping the promise to the student and I found that people 
will pay gladly pay for the value they sense they receive. That is, if they pay a dollar and they get a dollar ten in value back, they're very very happy. And what you're describing, what AOPA described, I think, is the other the other side or being behind the uh, lift over drag curve uh, in mm -hmm. that proposition. That is, people pay a buck and they're getting seventy five cents back. So let's talk about. Um, how simulations can help change that proposition. Okay, great. So, um, you know, my, my question and yours, I think, is what would our industry look like if we were really good at what we do, which is pilot training? Uh, and most of us would like to believe that we are pretty good at what we do, and maybe we are, but I had an opportunity to explore this in a university setting. Uh, and this opportunity came about because a large airline contract had gone away from the university and we were able to coax it back when I came in as executive director. Uh, but the, the airline representative sat across from the desk from me, and he looked at me and he said, you know, you know, Nick, you know what I hate? I hate surprises, and I hate these overfly bills, because the contract was set up so that the airline was paying for syllabus plus 10%. And if training went over syllabus plus 10%, then the flight operation was able to bill additional hours at some negotiated price. And there were a lot of additional hours being billed. So he said, you know, I really hate this. And I said, okay, well, I'll tell you what, here's my promise to you. We will not send you any overfly bills. So I started looking at the, the training activities and the hours and whatnot, and I came to the realization that we were doing fine on commercial hours and we were doing fine on instrument training hours. It was all private pilot. And the private pilot hours were up in the 70s. And of course, that's not going to surprise anybody. You know, there's a lot of people who say, well, yeah, 70s, you know, pretty typical for a private pilot. Uh, so I went to my director of standards and I said, look, I want a goal of 40 airplane hours for every pilot under this contract. And I got two responses. The first response was, well, we need to use more sim time. And the second response was, you know, really, 40? I don't know if we can do that. Uh, so, you know, that was the environment. I actually had a pretty strong belief that we could do that. And I addressed three things. The three things were lesson plans, simulation, and incentives. So when I talk about lesson plans, many flight schools train pilots using a syllabus. And if they don't, they should be ashamed of themselves. Uh, but almost everybody's got a syllabus. And the syllabus has the tasks that need to be accomplished during the lesson. So I kind of liken that to, you know, you're packing a box with stuff that you want to ship somewhere. You know, you've got 10 items to put in the box. And all those 10 items will fit in the box but only if you pack them in a particular way. And if you have no instructions, you've just got these 10 items and you need to pack them in the box, the first time you pack the box, it's probably not going to be right. And then you take the items out and you pack it again and, and so forth. And eventually, if you pack the box 10 times, maybe you'll come up with the formula that's perfect where everything fits in the box. And you say, voila, now I know how to do this. That would be experience. Now, if you wrote down exactly how to pack everything in the box, the next person who came along would be able to take your note and pack things in the box correctly the first time. And there wouldn't be that learning curve of 10, 10 times trying to pack the box before you get it right. So that's what a lesson plan really does. A lesson plan is a guide to packing the box. So we came up with some lesson plans that I was pretty pleased with. Uh, and the next thing I did was an incentive program. And the incentive program was unusual, and I got a lot of resistance to doing it, but essentially what I told my boss, who was, um, well, he was in charge of all the, the collegiate aviation stuff, I said, look, what I really want is I want the players on the field, I want the cheerleaders on the side, and I want the fans in the stands, and I want everybody to be a stakeholder. So what we did is we established this program whereby if we got a pilot done under 42 hours, there was a $1,000 award. And that $1,000 award was actually divided among the instructors, the supervisors, and all the people in the company. 
And then for under 45 hours, we did 500 bucks. So this was a, a big chunk of money, but I wanted to prove a point. Um, and the point was that incentives make a huge difference. Okay, so we put the incentive p situation in place. And then what we did with simulation was we had 10 hours of sim lessons prior to any flight in the airplane. We weren't using sophisticated sims. We were using Frasca mentors. We were running checklists, teaching airplane operations and maneuvers. But we had a, a goal. And the goal was to achieve understanding of what was being done so as to eliminate any confusion and to avoid explaining things in the airplane. So that was the idea, is that somebody getting out to the airplane was not doing anything that they didn't understand, especially in the beginning parts of training. The net result okay. of these things was that within about four months, we were pretty regularly turning out pilots with 38, 39, 40 hours, and competent pilots, because I made it clear that the hours were less important than the pilot be competent, but I didn't want to send any overfly bills and lose that contract. The feedback we got was pretty interesting. You know, a lot of the instructors were saying, you know, gee, I, I felt a lot of pressure to get pilots done in minimum times. And so I'd ask him, I'd say, well, did you send anybody to a check ride who wasn't competent at the private pilot level? And they said, well, no. So feeling pressured to get a customer done on time and within budget was a new thing for them. But eventually, that kind of performance became a point of pride for the school. So we went from, well, we can't do that, to, wow, we're really good at this. Uh, and those were the kind of results that we got. So, you know, I can point to that and say, okay, I've seen it done. Uh, and the times came down from in the 70s to in the high 30s to low 40s. And it happened with a significant number of students in a very short period of time. And I believe that all of the things, the lesson plans and the incentives, but also the simulation, were effective in reducing those times. Okay. <clears throat> so for the private, because uh, even with the new rules, um, not that much time counts towards the private. How, what was the reaction to the time being spent uh, in ATDs or simulators or whatever what, what you want to call, call it? Well, the flight instructors mostly didn't want to teach in the ATDs and simulators, especially at first. You know, their attitude was, hey, I'm a flight instructor, I'm not a sim instructor. Um, and, and it was one of those, well, gee, I make enough money flying, I apparently don't need the additional money. Uh, that I would make as a sim instructor. So, so we got a few of the more senior people who were more interested in seeing what, what they could do, what kind of results they could achieve, than they were in racking up flight hours. You know, you know, every flight school has some people in there who are, you know, they're, they're not really there for the flight hours. They're there because they love to teach. Uh, and those were the people who ended up doing the simulator instruction, and they really enjoyed it. And, okay. uh, yeah, so I'd like to offer an example of a complex Please. process, okay? Absolutely. So, this, is one, this, is, this is one that we all teach, uh, and, and this is an engine out, okay? So this is a typical engine out the way that I would teach it at you know, most places. Um, so, so the engine fails in flight, right? You've got to fly the airplane choose a landing site and maneuver toward it. Attempt to restart, you know, fuel, 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 mags, air, you know, whatever your procedure is. Set up for best glide. Pull the prop control back. Make sure the cowl flaps are closed and the air conditioner is off. Make an emergency call. Set the transponder to 7700. Activate the ELT. Notify the passengers. And by the way, what are you gonna say to them anyway? Uh, tighten the seatbelt. Secure loose objects, turn the fuel off, extend the flaps and gear, turn off the electrical power, and crack the cabin door. So interestingly enough, you know, when I was teaching at that beach of flight safety, the engine out emergency procedure 
to a landing without power was by far the longest memory checklist of any airplane taught at that training center. There's a lot of things to do. Okay, now the, the challenge of teaching that procedure in an airplane is, first of all, with a list that long, you're never going to get people doing it right the first time or the second time or the third time. Probably most of the time what you're going to be doing is prompting. And you're going to talk them through it. So if, if you've read Dr. John Medina's book, Brain Rules, uh, one of the things that, that uh, he talks about is that when you go through a process of learning, your brain actually changes. You are connecting circuits in your brain. You're actually wiring your brain to behave in a particular way. And one of the things that often happens in flight instruction is that in a complex process, the instructor is prompting the pilot being trained. And what they're doing is really conditioning that pilot to depend on promptings. And so, you know, a lot of pilots get toward the end of training, and, you know, when they're supposed to do something, they're still looking at their instructor waiting for a prompt, wondering, you know, is he going to prompt me or not? Well, that's because the brains have been wired that way. So when you have a That's complex a great procedure like that, you kind of have to decide, you know, how, you, how you're going to train it. And learning just a theory doesn't work. This is one of the things I learned in simulation you were asking about it. So I'll give you an example. I, you know, I have a group of King Air pilots or, or would-be King Air pilots in class, and we talk about the, the engine fire procedure. Okay, and it's been like 25 years. So it, it, the engine fire procedure is something like, you know, fuel, fuel, feather, fuel, firewall valve. Hello. Okay. And, and I'd ask, you know, what's the procedure? Fuel, fuel, feather, fuel, firewall valve. Okay, you got it. Great. And I'd get that same pilot in the sim, and we'd be about a third of the way down an ILS with a nice crosswind. So, you know, they're having to focus on keeping the needles where they're supposed to be. And I'd give them a firelight. And what I expected was they would go through the motions, you know, fuel, fuel, feather, fuel, firewall valve. But what I got oftentimes was, was nothing or sort of a random response, um, in part because when they had learned the procedure in the classroom, there wasn't the motion of going through and doing the things. You know, you can do that in a cockpit procedures trainer, but you don't do it in a classroom. And the other thing was that a lot of their brain power was being used up trying to keep the needles crossed on the ILS. And there wasn't the same amount of bandwidth that there was for recall and activity as there was in the classroom when there were no other distractions. So one, one of the things I learned about that is that when you want something to behave, somebody to behave in a particular way, teaching in context is really important. And one of the delightful things about simulation is that you can create context. The, the serious people are now talking about how they, they've had a lot of saves, you know, people pulling the chute and saving themselves. And for a while, it kind of wasn't that way. You know, they put the parachute on the airplane and, uh, you know, figured that a lot of people were going to be saved, and it, and it just didn't seem, you know, the stats didn't really follow that. Um, but now, you know, uh, you listen to uh, the Cirrus folks, and they're, they're talking about how, hey, you know, we had all these saves. Well, what did you do differently? And, and what they'll tell you is they started putting people into the simulator, and they put them in the context, in the situation where they wanted them to pull the chute. And then they had them pull the chute in the simulator. And having been through the process and the context and taken the desired action, now these pilots were doing exactly what was hoped. But in all of the training before that, that had never been done. So they got a huge shift on just one pilot action, which is pulling the chute. But the way that they got it is using simulation and creating context and then having the person do the desired behavior in that context. So when you well, think about training, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, please, please finish your statement. I'm sorry. 
Uh, I was going to start you. something else. I, I babble on, so so feel free to stop me anytime. No, you're not babbling. This is great. This is this is good stuff, as they say, as uh, Martin McFly once said. The uh, the uh, what really hit home was when you said uh, when you talked about the prompting. Um, as a Part 61 instructor in uh, airplanes, um, in airplanes that. Uh, uh, excuse me, that uh, own, that owners have or in a flight school airplane. A lot of times my life has been spent going up and down to oh, 4,000 feet AGL so we could pull the power, do it again, pull the power, do it again. And your whole point about prompting really makes sense. Um, uh, I've seen it myself in my own, in my own training. And... Um, I now have access to a uh, to a Redbird, and it's really kind of fun just putting somebody in there and saying, "I've got one one scenario where the engine just dies within five minutes. Mm-hmm. It's an oil pressure. It's an oil pressure thing. Um, I sneak it in on them. Um, they and it's insidious because I don't tell them it's coming. I just sit there and I just fly to Des Moines from Omaha, and uh, then uh, then it dies." You know, the oil pressure goes away and then it dies. And if if we're lucky, it's it's random. I don't know when it's going to happen. So if we're lucky, we're near a grass strip. Otherwise, they get to figure out how to land on a farmer's field. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a great uh, it's a great uh, tool for that. And when I take them up in the airplane after that, it's uh, it works. And that leads me to my uh, to my uh, the point I was going to make is. I'm a Part 61 guy, and I'm fortunate enough to have access to have had access to Frascas and to uh, Redbirds and so on. We have a range of people on the call, everything from <coughs> Part 61 guys uh, on their own to 141 people uh, in large universities. The large universities pretty much have it covered, uh, obviously. Uh, even the smaller institutions have got pretty pretty good simulation environments. But what about uh, the guy who's doing this out of love of aviation? He's a Part 61 instructor. He's doing everything right. Good instructor. Mm-hmm. But he doesn't have you know, he doesn't have access to any of these devices. As far as for example, as far as I know, uh, the Redbird that I'm that I have access to is the only uh, full motion Redbird. Uh, other than what's at University of Nebraska Omaha, but the uh, mm-hmm. this is the only full motion redbird that I know within 250 miles. So what's a guy saying? Uh, oh, I don't know, Boone, Iowa, to pick one of my favorite mm-hmm. small towns. <laughs> and he's he's, he's teaching out. I know Boone well. Trust me. Um, uh-huh. uh, he's teaching out of the Boone Airport, and I don't know if this is a real situation or not. I'm making it up. But he's in Boone, sure. Iowa. He's teaching out of there, and he wants to he wants to run these scenarios. What are what options do you see for somebody like that? You know, simulation tools are not hugely expensive, uh, and screens are not hugely expensive either these days. So, uh, you know, when when I had the flight school in Seattle, we set up a, a training lab that was using computers running Microsoft Flight Simulator. And of course, in Seattle, there were a lot of people who were who were very familiar with Flight Sim. Uh, so that was nice. And, you know, you can use Flight Sim for all kinds of things. The the graphics are really good. If you want to show somebody uh, VFR checkpoints, if you want to show them the practice areas and the boundaries of those and have them be able to identify them in flight, uh, you want to do a traffic pattern, you want to show people airports uh, that they're going to go to. In fact, you can do an awful lot with really inexpensive simulation. There are some caveats when you use that, and you're going to teach people how to perform maneuvers or procedures. Uh, And the biggest one, actually, and and the the, the one area where I think I really like a Redbird sim as opposed to, say, for example, a single-screen Frasca Mentor, uh, is, you know, before you're going to do a maneuver, you're going to do clearing turns and look for traffic. And you can actually do that in a sim with a wraparound visual uh, but you can't. I mean, it's it's just a little hokey, right? You're sitting in front of your your TV with your 
with your Microsoft Flight Sim, and you're looking to the left and to the right. And, and uh, but all the same, you know, if you're wiring somebody's brain and you say, okay, well, you know, let's try a steep turn to the left, and the first thing they do is turn their head to the left and to the right to look for traffic, and say, okay, well, let's do a clearing turn first. Well, you can teach that using simulation. Okay. One of the one of the questions I often get is, well, you know, the the simulator, whatever it is, is not like the airplane I'm using. In other words, there isn't a hundred percent correspondence between the sim and the airplane. And, mm -hmm. you know, I understand that. I feel your pain. I, I had one trainer at the beach factory that I used, and I trained Bonanza Baron and Duke pilots. So the range of airplanes was the 36, the 36TC, uh, the 55, the 58, the 58P, the 58TC, and the 60. Uh, and those airplanes have, have very different panel layouts and configuration of switches. And what we had was kind of a... Uh, you know, sort of a 58P Baron that we modified so that we could teach the other airplanes. Uh, but it was never exactly right. But but uh, the realization that I came to is when you're teaching process is that if somebody understands and follows the process, if the switches are in a different location, it doesn't take them very long to, to figure that out and, and deal with it. Um, so this is a, a question you know, I got from people who were saying, well, you know, the, the panel's different. I said, okay. Well, let's suppose that you train a private pilot, and you're going to train up a really good private pilot, and you're going to train them in a Cessna 172. Mm -hmm. And they just got their private license at, you know, 50 or 60 or 70 hours or whatever it was, but they're a, they're a competent Cessna 172 private pilot. Now you want to transition them into a Piper Warrior. How long is it going to take you to transition them to the Piper Warrior? And the answer is, well, you know, a couple hours probably, check out. And I said, okay. So what does that tell you about how much of piloting is airplane type specific? I said, well, okay, I kind of see your point. A lot of training is not airplane type specific. You know, I can make an argument easily for training in two or three different types of airplanes during private pilot training mm -hmm. and still having it be efficient. It's just wiring people's brains differently in terms of how they think about airplanes. Great points. Great points. What about the objection, and I, I touched on it earlier, but I don't think uh, we really addressed it. A lot of what I run into in my own experience. I'll do it this way. Pilots come to me and say, well, the time doesn't count. And I, all, I can, all I can do is shrug my shoulders politely and say, well, it'll pay back at the, at the far end. And the, and the insurance company and the FAA will love to see the ground training. Is that a valid answer well, or is there a better answer? Well, so, so the better answer really has to do with the customer life cycle cost that I talked about before. And say, well, you know, the, the, that sim time doesn't count. Keep in mind that 80% of the people who walk in the door walk out the door without a pilot's license. That means mm -hmm. all of the instrument training, all of the commercial training, all of the multi-engine training, all of the CFI training, all of that vaporizes when that customer walks out the door because we didn't keep our promises to them or meet expectations, and, you know, we racked up flight hours, you know, and now, you know, it's kind of like the goose that lays the golden eggs, right? You know, the old fable about, you know, the goose laying the golden eggs and somebody decides, hey, we'll cut the goose open and get all the golden eggs. Uh, and, of course, the goose dies, and that's the end of that. You know, in some ways, it's sort of the same thing. So the question is, can we meet our customers' expectations at the private pilot level? Can we, for lack of a better term, keep our promises to them? in terms of what it's actually going to take to get a license. One of the real dilemmas that we had in the university world was, well, how do we, how do we position our pricing? Because we know they're not going to get done in 40 hours of airplane time or 36 hours, whatever the syllabus was. We know it's probably going to take them 50 or 60 or 70 hours. 
But if we put the price tag out there for a 70-hour private license, if that's our average, they'll wave off. They'll go to some other school. They'll go to another program. So we really need to, you know, kind of put our pricing on this on a par with everybody else, which means that we're pricing at the minimum times. And somewhere in the fine print, there will be a little note that says, oh, by the way, individual student times may vary. Your time may be higher, probably will be. National average is 65 to 75. Uh, so, but, but that's in the real fine print, right? So somebody comes in, how much are you going to learn to fly? How, you know, I used to tell people $10,000 private license. And then, of course, there was the mealy mouth stuff about, yeah, but by the way, you know, times may vary, et cetera. Um, and, and that's why I really liked the experiment that we did in a university setting with those airline trainings, because we had enough numbers and we had a history of 70-hour private pilots, and we reshaped our thinking about what we were doing and yielded you know, 38, 39, 40-hour pilots pretty consistently. So the time doesn't count. Right, you can't log, you know, the poor instructor can't log time in their logbook for simulator dual given. I mean, they can, but it doesn't mean anything, uh, which is too bad, by the way, because they'll learn more in simulator training than they will in airplane training. I have to agree with that. It's, but it's the customer and you say, well, well, the customer, you know, that time doesn't count toward the private license. Well, that's true. But if the SIM tool that you're using costs a whole lot less than the airplane training and is three times as effective in terms of brain wiring, you know, because we're cutting through that metal cut on cut, then the customer is going to be so much better off if, a simula if simulation is properly used to train them because they're going to get done in about the time and about the cost that they originally anticipated. And so they won't get to this point where, oh, gee, I've, I've spent the money I allocated toward this, and I've still got, you know, it looks like I've got four or $5,000 left to go to finish, because that's a hard decision point, right? Somebody's got to cough up four or five grand to finish the training, and they're very vulnerable at that point. You know, right. Should I keep going and, and, you know, find the extra money, or should I cut my losses and run? And a lot of people cut their losses and run. So what I'm suggesting is that using simulation properly could completely shift our performance with regards to the customer base that we spend so much time and energy. The AOPA spends, you know, time, energy, and money. EAA spends time, energy, and money. Everybody spends time, energy, and money to get people into aviation. And our problem is not getting people into aviation. Our problem is an 80% dropout rate. And if we could cut that from 80 to 40, our industry would be entirely different. We'd sell so many more airplanes. Instructors would get more flight hours. Now, the, the industry would be thriving, and it really I can't is hurt. about – I'm sorry. Yeah, I can't, I'm sorry. I, I, was, I, was just, I was just about to say I couldn't agree with you more. Um, so, and again, um, and I think you, you kind of answered it. You, you're saying the, the answer you were giving me revolved around the instructor, but the uh, – excuse me. But the question I was really asking is I've had actually had private, even private customers who, who read the regulations and know something about the regs come back and say, well, that time doesn't count. What do I do, you know, what do, I do with it? And I think we have to turn the, answer, the same answer you give the instructor back to them and say, we're trying to save you money. We're trying to give you the value that you're paying for. Um, upfront, right, and, right. and, and you, you, you're completely correct, I think, in, in that regard, in that the case has to be made. And if the instructor fails to make the case, or the flight school ma fails to make the case, then, you know, the customer is probably not going to buy in. Uh, and they have that vulnerability right as the time builds up. Uh, but, but what I'm suggesting is that it is possible for a school to have a training culture that says, this is how we do things. These are the kind of results that we get. We keep our promises. There will be no surprises. You're not going to have overfly bills. And you build okay. 
a curriculum and a training process around that mentality. Uh, personally, I believe that the schools who are willing to adopt that mentality and teach their instructors a what I would call a sim-centric culture are going to be able to very effectively compete. And effectively competing means not only getting private pilot training, it means getting that entire customer life cycle cost from a training standpoint. If you're really good at what you do and people know it, you can even charge a premium for flying fewer flight hours, but getting people done on time and in budget. Okay. So for those of us that are interested in, and I've been avoiding, avoiding this, this phrase like the plague, but it's the only one that fits, uh, for those of us interested in, this, in, the, in a paradigm shift of this nature, too many buzzwords there, I apologize, but how do we... Where do we start? What is the right way for a pilot to evaluate, for an instructor or school to evaluate themselves and turn their lessons into a simulator or simulator centric or simulation centric uh, universe? Where would, where would you where would you recommend somebody starting from scratch uh, to do this? So if they if they really really want to do it. Um, I've, I've answered that question um, in, in my own way. Uh, and in my own way, what I did is I sat down and I said, you know, at this university we were able to get the times down to syllabus hours by using 10 hours of simulation. And that 10 hours of simulation was all up front. It was before the, you know, they ever got in and really turned a prop. And my question was, you know, could I write a curriculum that interspersed sim training and flight training in such a way that I could yield some, some really outstanding results uh, in terms of airplane hours. And I did. I actually I created a curriculum with lesson plans. Um, I've done it as a consultant for a couple of institutions. And I guess I would say that um, you know, that, that curriculum is available uh, from me as a consultant, uh, and if somebody is seriously interested in it, what I'm doing with John Gibson is I'm looking for a couple of additional schools. I already have one school who's very interested in doing this. Uh, I'm looking for some schools that want to test that curriculum, and I'm willing to train the instructors and establish the culture for the school and provide the lesson plans, which really are the, the, are the challenging part of it, is creating the lesson plans. It's hugely time consuming. Uh, so, so I'm willing to teach schools to make this paradigm shift if it's something that they really, really want to do. Okay. Okay. Um, and I neglected to put your uh, information uh, on the PowerPoint, would you be willing to uh, would you uh, be willing to share your email and, or contact information with everybody right now? Oh, of course. So email is pretty easy. It's Nick N I C K dot Frisch F R I S C H S as in Sierra at gmail dot com. Okay. Um, I'm going to open up the. Uh, oops. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to give a phone number, too. It's 360-595-4399. Oh, okay, and we'll repeat that one more time for me before we break off. I'm going to open up the mics, um, and if anybody's got any questions for Nick, uh, please uh, feel free to jump in. Um, there were a couple of people, uh, I had the mics open before, they were, uh, there was a little bit of background noise, so as usual, I'm going to ask people to, to mute, mute their own individual microphones if uh, they're in a noisy, noisy environment, otherwise I'll have to do it from, uh, from here. So if anybody's got any questions, uh, please uh, jump in. Yeah, this is Steve, can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, no, hey, yeah. somebody. Yeah, are you going somewhere? Oops, got a couple there, a couple of side conversations. I can go there if you want. This is such the over. This is Steve. Uh, my question to you would be how many of the people listening are in a 
full-time school versus uh, Part 61 guys working out of Podunk uh, Airport. This is Fred Abrams in California. I'm working at a full-time school. This Any other? Able, uh, were you able to hear Mike, that? The reason I asked the question is, uh, you know, most of us, a lot of, in my case, I'm working out of a little airport. I got a lot of time, but uh, there's no way to get simulation involved. Although I am very much in favor of simulation, I've got probably a couple hundred hours of simulator airline simulator time. So it's a great tool, and I agree with the uh, speaker on that point. Well, Nick, um, can you talk to that a little bit about how a small operation, I, I know you kind of, we touched on it, but with something well, as simple well, as, sure. as... You know, m most of what you need is a computer and a TV screen uh, and some uh, set up with, with some flight controls. Uh, you know, you could do that with a joystick and a set of rudder pedals or, you know, there, there are lots of outfits that, that sell uh, yoke and rudder pedal type setups. You can do it with an AOPA J. They're not hugely expensive, uh, particularly when you consider what, what uh, people spend in additional flight hours to get a private license compared to what they might spend. Now, most, most pilots in what they had spent in additional hours could, could afford their own AOPA J. Uh, they're not huge, hugely expensive. So, uh, you know, if, if, I guess I would say that if you're not in a position to be able to spend, you know, a thousand or fifteen hundred bucks on simulation, uh, then then you're probably get, you know you're you're on the you're certainly on the poor side of the bell curve, you know, where training institutions go. Uh, and and I can't really you know, I can't wave wave a magic wand and make that problem go away. Uh, but most training institutions can afford some level of simulation, uh, and they just don't, in part. Aviation has has two what I call perverse incentives. I call them thing one and thing two. Uh, and, and thing one is that most flight schools measure their business by the number of flight hours. So when I was in a u university program, it was a big deal that we were flying 50,000 flight hours even though we might have been a much better school flying 40 or 45,000 flight hours. And thing two is the instructors measuring their personal success by additional flight hours in the logbook. And the thing about those two incentives is that what they really tend to add up to is, you know, the girl in the story and the guy poking his finger at me. They quit. So... Uh, I'm not sure I answered your question very well. But, well, but, uh, you did in a sense, but I'm more curious uh, from maybe Nathy could give this information out as to, um, because, again, if I'm in a school, talking my chief pilot into a simulator may not be too big a deal. If I'm at uh, Podunk Airport, uh, I may not have that ability. Now, personally, I dry fly my students a lot. I make them sit in the airplane and dry fly the airplane. I charge a fair amount of money for my time, but they're not paying out airplane time. That's kind of my yeah, way of doing and, the simulation. And you know what? And that that actually is a form of simulation, right? Because right. Uh, you're, you're creating the environment and you're having them run the tasks. You know, it's it's it doesn't have the same context, but it's still way better than than trying to teach them the same thing with the engine running and the and the, the dollar meter going. And, and the problem is most of the uh, lot of instructors are just interested, interested in the dollar sign. You can still get the dollar sign by doing the dry fly and you get, in other words, I basically tell the student it's going to be an hour and 15 to an hour and a half flight lesson, but you're going to pay for roughly two hours. And that's the way, if they don't like that price, eventually you have to stop selling yourself short. Sure. Well, I'm I'm guessing you're one of those guys who, you know, putting additional hours in the logbook doesn't really mean that much to you. Uh, and I haven't more interested entered in a logbook since 1969. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So so what you're really interested in is primarily is teaching and the success of your students. Uh, so you know, in in your way, what you're doing is um, an effective training tool that that is like simulation in in some ways. Uh, you know, 
just have the full scope that you can get with simulation, but it's way better than than trying to explain things in airplanes. Yes. Uh, you know, I think if if instructors can figure out ways to avoid explanations of things in airplanes, when most of their students don't have the bandwidth to absorb the explanation anyway, that the students are going to be so much better off when they're actually paying for a flight hour. And and again, most of my whenever I can, I try and conduct the briefing sitting in the airplane. It tips them, it kind of spools them up to being in the environment that they're going to be operating in. That's just a personal technique, though. That's a good one. Well, I, like I think that. that's, that's actually a, a wonderful technique. Um, I'm, I'm stealing sure it. That you're, the, the kind of results that you get are re reflected by that. Well, and a, a question I have for you is you talked about lowering and uh, using a, uh, a syllabus and um, you got your, your production time down, so to speak. I'm curious, did you ever follow up to find out if those students um, had a higher percentage of, of um, uh, their name being entered in the NTSB records uh, for various reasons or conflicts with the FAA? Just curious if they were a, a better student, I mean, became a better pilot, uh, or you got them out the door early. Um, I'm not necessarily in favor of that. That's why I was kind of curious if there was ever any follow-up on that process. Yeah, I guess I would say that, that uh, I don't have any, any that data on that. Almost all of those pilots went immediately into instrument commercial training after their private pilot training, and most of them are flying airliners. Now. Well, it's, uh, if you've got a second for a quick story, I went through one training where it was an all-automated, it was 757 for a major carrier, and I kept track. We manually flew the simulator 40 minutes out of 40 hours each. So in other words, 20 hours of pilot time was all on autopilot, automation, all that stuff. I got into the real airplane and was making a hand-flown approach uh, to minimums, and the guy told me to go around. The, I pushed the throttles up, the nose pitched up. My brain went into automation, said, oh, autopilot's doing this maneuver. And the airplane just leaps into the sky, and the next thing I know, I'm going through 15, 18, 16 degrees at a very rapid pitch angle, at a very rapid rate in a 200,000-pound airplane. And I said, screw this, and I pushed the nose over. My co-pilot was in jump seat. The, the training pilot uh, said, wow, I've never seen the autopilot do that. And my co-pilot and I both at the same time said, what autopilot? I'm manually flying the airplane. Automation can lead you down that primrose path. That's the one fault I have with simulation. It can take you way down a primrose path that you've got no escape for. So I'll let it go at that. <laughs> All right. So I'll jump Bob's so, here to So I'll jump in on that. I think based on what um uh based on what uh you said, Nick, that we really have to train those scenarios. So set something up like that, do a do a gotcha on a student, and I don't like the term gotcha, but set them up where they may be expecting one thing and something else comes up, but it, realistic scenario. And they have to they have to fly and think their think and fly their way through it. Well, that's the yes. problem. We're teaching automation. We're not teaching thinking anymore. You know, I guess I would say that that one of the things I like about simulation is yes, being able to put the training into context, uh, and the context is the activity. So the the King Air example I used, where they were flying the ILS and then they had to deal with the firelight, is training in context. And automation is no different, really, uh, because you can train automation in context, and you can train automation failures in context, which really ought to be done in every airplane where automation is a significant part of what the pilot is going to be doing. Because what you're really doing in any kind of training is you're wiring somebody's brain to deal with 
whatever it is that they're going to have to deal with in, in the real world. And if it's done correctly, then you have to, you know, you have reason to believe that they're going to be successful. A space shuttle pilot is trained using simulation pretty exclusively. There's no airplane. Uh, and their first mission is their first mission. And if they've been trained correctly, then in theory they ought to be, you know, doing the habitual tasks by habit. <coughs> and they ought to be able to have enough bandwidth left over because their habits are so good that they have time to think. And I would say that that, that flying an airplane really is no different in that regard. That's a great point. Nick, uh, this is John Gibson. I was going to just jump in here for a second. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, Warren Hendrickson asked the question, any particular recommendations for a Cessna 172 Garmin 1000 desktop simulator? And Fred Stahl indicates that a Redbird BATD or an AATD can be had in a 172G1000 configuration. Do you have any uh, suggestions or recommendations on a desktop simulator um, for G1000? Actually, at this point, for a G1000, I don't. Okay. You know, yeah, I know there's I can... some stuff out there, but the technology changes pretty fast. So I, I'd advise going shopping on the Internet. Okay, yeah, I would have to talk. I disagree with that. Using those things, and then I'm using. Go ahead. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, is there not a uh, Redbird desktop that I think uh, has a maybe a 182 G1000 for I, somewhere around 7,000? I know that's still a lot of money, but um, could be an asset if if you got a lot of students to that you can amortize the that fee over. Does that make sense? Yeah, Redbird does make one, and that's about the right price. Um, yeah. yeah, that would be the price for that would be the price for their BATD about seven thousand. Yeah, that's that a sounds desktop, right to me. Right? Yes. That's a desktop. Yeah. That's correct. Okay, I'd like to make another comment. Uh, you guys were talking about the fact that a, a lot of flight. How do you justify to either the student or the flight instructor the fact that the FAA is not going to count anything more than two and a half hours in the simulator? Um, and I don't. I don't remember anybody bringing this up, but, they, but we've all agreed that the um, average student pilot's going to have somewhere around 75 hours of flying time by the time he's ready for a check ride. So if that's 35 hours more than the 40 hours that's required for Part 61, and if the simulator is three times more effective than the, uh, than the airplane in teaching a concept, then certainly those extra hours, who cares whether the FAA gives any value to it? Uh, yeah, I'll give, I'll give an, I can give an example. This is Fred Stahl. I'll give an example of where uh, I've actually had private students come and say to me, you know, I want to, you know I'd like you to give me more of this kind of thing, and uh, where we basically do a, do a sim a scenario and just a Redbird a basic ATD where uh, they're basically flying straight and level cruise uh, VFR, <coughs> And all of a sudden, I put them into clouds, okay? And of course, what I want to see them do is things like uh, 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 competently make a 180 degree turn so they can get out of it. And uh, they, they eat that up because they know they can't really do that uh, uh, realistically in the airplane. Uh, they ask for more of this, and I, you know, and and after a while, I I tried a few things myself. I realized that even with the uh, Redbird Basic ATD. Uh, you can do a pretty good job simulating uh, spin entries and recoveries uh, of VMC and IMC. And uh, I mean, I've had privates where they've racked up, you know, in excess of five hours in the sim, and they never, they never express, expressed any concern about the fact that they can only log, you know, maybe two and a half hours uh, because they, they. They understood that they could never get any of that stuff in the real airplane. Sure. And so it's just a matter of education is all. Uh, both educating the flight instructor as well as the student. Um, Absolutely. And I, I'd like to make another point. Uh, and this goes all the way back to the 60s, the late 60s. Uh, I was working out at Chicago Midway Airport uh, with uh, Rudy Frasca's number one, two, and three simulators, uh, the, very, the very beginning of general aviation simulation. Um, and there was a dispatcher that we had that was uh, working on a private pilot's license. And whenever he had some time, he'd go out in the airplane and uh, fly the traffic pattern. So 
But the other thing that he would do is that in the office, whenever he had a, a chance, he would jump in the simulator. And, and even though he's working on a private pilot's license, and there were no visuals in those days, it was the, 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 the original Rudy Frasca simulators did not have TV monitors. Uh, it was just 100% instruments. And so he would fly around in the, in the Frasca whenever he had a chance. Well, one day, and you're probably aware of uh, the fact that uh, most pilots are going to lose, lose their life within 175 seconds of losing a natural horizon uh, because they just they haven't been trained. Uh, to respond appropriately. So anyway, this guy was doing takeoffs and landings at Chicago Midway. Um, the fog rolled in from the lake, from Lake Michigan, and as he was taking off, he ran into a cloud. He keyed the mic and said to the tower, I just ran into the cloud, and the tower said, yeah, we saw you do that. Uh, if you make a 90-degree turn to the left, you'll come right back out again. So normally, most people in that situation probably would have lost control of the aircraft pretty quickly. But, but because of all the time that he spent in the Frasca, he rolled into about a 15-degree bank uh, and, and, and just watched the heading come around. And when he, as he had turned 90 degrees, he rolled out and flew out of the cloud and everything ended up well. So that, that would have been highly unlikely if he had not been doing that simulator time. And it didn't go into his logbook. It wasn't, he didn't have an instructor looking over his shoulder. So it wasn't time that he could count. But I'm sure, there's no doubt in my mind, that it saved his life that day. Yeah, and I think if you can uh, help car help the student to correlate in his own mind how uh, just kind of you know off the books uh, training like that can or might one day save his life and that that of his passengers, uh, then all of a sudden they stop caring about whether the hours count or that they have to pay for it or whatever. Precisely, and with a young flight instructor that wants to build time in his logbook, I think the the point that uh, Nick made about if we can the 80% that are dropping out of training, if we can do something to mitigate that so that those people do complete their private, move on to an instrument rating, move on to a commercial, move on to maybe a flight instructor certificate, move on to multi-engine training, there's all that extra training that flight instructor is going to be able to get with that yeah. student if he, if he can hang on to them. So I think that's, and that's great. Really what it's, I think that's really what it's about. It's the value-added proposition. That we right. serve our students, we serve our customers, and that uh, we do we do a better job of of quite frankly delighting our customers. I don't know how else to say it. They're glad they came. Oh, yeah. So what if you Absolutely. put it to them this way? What if you said, okay, you know, I'm going to get you done in 40 hours of airplane time and 10 hours of sim time, and and uh, most of that sim time isn't going to count toward anything. Uh, but but with the uh, 30 or so airplane hours that, that I have saved you, you, you can rent the airplane, and instead of using that 30 hours to go up and, and do stalls and steep turns and slow flight and traffic patterns, you can rent the airplane and fly to Oshkosh and spend your time at Oshkosh and then fly back and yeah. have an entirely different experience with that money than you would have had you know, if it took you 70 hours to get your private license. How about that? Excellent point, excellent point. Um, and I'd like to uh, uh, talk to Nick um, at some time in the near future. I really like his idea about uh, sharing those uh, lesson plans. I'd like to discuss that more. I, I started out in the Air Force as a simulator operator in the 60s on a KC-135 simulator and talking about how the simulation, the simulator just doesn't fly exactly like the airplane does. I tell my students even the airplane doesn't fly like an airplane under certain circumstances. <laughs> and it, there you go. So tell them the nice. airplane doesn't fly like the simulator. Yeah, well, I actually did that when I was 19 years old. I was a simulator operator in the Air Force. I rode jump seat on a KC-135 from March Air Force Base to uh, uh, someplace in Alaska. I forgot. If you can remember the 60s, you weren't really there. So I don't remember where we ended up in Alaska. But anyway, I was sitting in the jump seat, and, the, and the, we're at 30-some-odd thousand feet, and the captain and the co-pilot are watching the number three eper and they can't get it to settle down they're jockeying the throttle back and forth trying to get what they want out of that eper setting and these guys are in their maybe mid-20s or so i'm not even 20 years old yet and they're really seriously concentrating on this problem and i was in between the two of them and i said this goddamn thing doesn't fly like a simulator does it and the two of them, <laughs> the two of them looked at me rather sheepish because they had been in the simulator and told me exactly that the simulator didn't work like the airplane. So, um, oh, so for, every, for every glitch that you have in a simulator, for everything that doesn't happen exactly the way you expect it to happen, you can always come up 
with a logical explanation. You caught, and the reason why the airplane went down when you pulled up was uh, you caught a downdraft. So just wait for the updraft to bring you back up again or whatever. So you can always and, – and, and the whole point of the simulator is you do whatever you got to do to get the airplane to, do, to respond appropriately. You don't want to – you don't want to be a passenger. You want to be the pilot in command. You want to be in charge of the airplane. So if the simulator is not doing right. what you want it to do, do whatever you got to do to make it do what you want it to do. I so would anyway, add you to that, to that point in particular, uh, which is the, the statement, you know, the sim doesn't fly like the airplane. So, so I've trained a few hundred people to using simulation, uh, you know, mostly, you know, beach, beach pilots. And, and I got that a lot, you know, this – you know, the, the sim just doesn't feel like, and, and a lot of these were fixed-based sims, so, you know, the sim doesn't feel like an airplane. You know, right. I, I can't feel my control inputs. Uh, and I came to the realization over time that uh, there's two kinds of pilots, actually, the kind that over-control airplanes <laughs> and the kind that don't. And the kind that over-control airplanes expect to feel their control inputs. Mm. Uh, and what I explained to them is if you're making a control input and you can feel it, you're over controlling the airplane. Right. Instrument flying is a visual activity, and you really should be focusing entirely on your eyes and nothing on the kinesthetics. And right. if you learn to fly an airplane in a way that, that you're not making abrupt control inputs or sudden control inputs, you shouldn't feel those inputs anyway. Uh, so, yeah. the, you know, it's, you transition people away from over controlling airplanes, and all of a sudden the sim flies a lot like an airplane. Right. Excellent. Great point. Uh, I really try very hard to wean people off of using any more than two fingers on the yoke. Yep. And well, uh, pilot, uh, pilot's best friend is uh, is the trim wheel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. My, when my student asks me when he should trim, I tell him the way people <laughs> vote in Chicago early and often. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Yeah, Fred, I grew up, I grew up in Cook County. I can uh, I can relate to that. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, you and I, have, you and I have talked about that before. Yeah, just uh, we're going to have to close it out here because we've uh, we've gone over our time and it's been a great conversation. Fred, two things. Uh, one, you, uh, I have to ask, what, was the 135 in the train like the B52 simulators, or was that fixed? No, it was. Uh, this is 1961 technology, so it was bolted to the floor. Um, bolted to the floor because because I know the 52s were were run around on tra in a in a coach. So. Oh, oh, no, 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 I misunderstood your question. Yeah, we, they were building a railroad car. So I spent my, I spent three years in the Air Force going from base to base. It was uh, like a civilian job. The, the people at the Air Force Base didn't even know why we were there. The only people that knew what we were doing was the uh, crews that we were training. Okay. And the other thing, Fred, that you teed up, and I'm going to use you as a transition here, is, Nick, if you can give your contact information out one more time for everybody, and I promise not to interrupt this time. Okay, happy to do that. Phone number is 360-595-4399. Email is nick, N-I-C-K, dot frish, which is foxtrot, romeo, india, sierra, charlie, hotel, at gmail.com. Okay, great. Thanks, Nick. And, that, and thank you very much for your time tonight. It was a great conversation and you did what every good instructor should do is you you started a discussion you got people thinking and that's terrific um, maybe maybe down a different path and uh, I really appreciate it everybody I want to wish you all a very happy holiday season we're at the end of the year a great time to reflect on where you've been and where where you're going um, I want everybody as always I always close these out everybody be safe out there I know that sounds like Hill Street Blues but I do mean it uh, <laughs> I want you all to be uh, safe, get a lot of students, uh, enjoy your holidays, and uh, we'll see you next month. Next month, uh, John Niehaus will, come, will be talking about social media part two. He's feverishly working on his PowerPoints as we speak, so we can talk about it. And this is social media and how it relates into uh, getting and hanging on to uh, new students. With that, everybody, thank you very much for attending, and we'll see you next month. Thank you.